the objectives today are going to be to um, be aware of the prevalence and the economic burden of AFib, understand some basic mechanisms in AFib physiology, understand patient's risk of stroke and how we can calculate that and stratify that, understand the current treatments for stroke risk reduction. Uh, we're going to talk about when to consider a rhythm control strategy for AFib patients, and we're going to talk a little bit about some more contemporary ablation technology. So we'll start off very basic with, uh, with the burden of AFib in the population. It's up to almost 6.1 million Americans that have AFib, which I'm sure doesn't surprise every, anybody. You see it every day. This is expected to go on to double in the next 20 to 25 years. If you look at uh, the age distribution of AFib, 2% of people under age 65 will have AFib. 9% of people over age 65 will have AFib. If you look at all the AFib patients that are out there, only 1% of them are less than 60 years old, and only 12% of them are, are over 75 or 75 to 84 years. So the vast majority of these patients are going to be in the 65 to 75 year old age range, which I'm sure you guys are seeing. If you look at um, if you look at risk factors that are associated with AFib, uh, it's it's not a surprise that we see a lot of it because these risk factors are incredibly common in our population. Uh, I, I doubt you can go a day without seeing almost all of these in any given patient. And, uh, and all of these things are associated with, with increased AFib uh, prevalence. So that helps explain why we're seeing so much of it. This used to be described to me as a nuisance rhythm, not really a big deal. We, anticoagulate or not and sort of control their heart rate and you go on your way living in AFib. But this really isn't the case and, and the more we learn about AFib, the more we know that this is really a big problem and it's associated with a lot of bad things. We know about hospitalizations here. We see patients with AFib every day. There's a, a threefold increase in the risk of heart failure, twofold increase in the risk of dementia and, and cognitive impairment in general is, is sort of a, a hotter topic these days and there's a big association there. <clears throat> Obviously, the five-fold increased risk for stroke in all comers, and that's even higher in some patients, and, and it's associated with a two-fold increase in the risk of mortality. If you look just at hospitalizations, there's over 460,000 hospitalizations with AFib as the primary diagnosis in the United States. Patients with AFib are likely to be hospitalized twice as long and three times as likely to have multiple admissions. So, again, in this day and age of, of admission times and readmissions and, and qualitative care, uh, this is a big deal for everybody. And that leads to a lot of cost and money in the healthcare system, which of course is important. With all these hospitalizations, it comes with on average an annual uh, cost of more than $8,700 per patient that has AFib. And if you take it all together, ablation and treatment, hospitalizations, everything else, it leads to over $26 billion added to the U.S. healthcare pill uh, annually. And again, this is probably just going to go up. <clears throat> if you look at the distribution of, of AFib and cost of AFib, um, you see that our area here in Florida, along with the whole southeast and east coast generally, is very high, um, very high prevalence, more so in the, than in the Midwest and the West Coast. Again, probably related to these risk factors that we went over and, and I showed you and their prevalence in these areas. So let's talk a little bit about um, the mechanisms of AFib, uh, what triggers AFib and what we've sort of learned about AFib uh, over the last 20 years specifically. First of all, we have to speak the same language when we're talking about it. Uh, we have to understand the nomenclature, which I think most people do. But just as a, as a reminder, when we talk about paroxysmal AFib, this is AFib that comes and goes. Uh, it, sponta it, it spontaneously terminates. You don't need a cardioversion, and that usually happens within 48 hours. When we, just, when we talk about persistent AFib, we're talking about an episode that's lasting on its own more than a week, uh, or an episode that we have to get you out of by either cardioverting or uh, using drugs to, to cardiovert. And then we get into this uh, a little bit more nuanced definition of longstanding persistent AFib or permanent AFib. It's pretty straightforward. If you've been in persistent AFib for more than a year, you're now considered long-standing persistent. And if you have AFib that your doctor is not considering any more cardioversions or antiarrhythmic medications, and we've essentially said you're going to be on a rate control strategy, 
we're accepting your AFib, you know, as, as chronic, so to speak, then this is considered permanent AFib. And so this is a decision that, you know, the physician and the doctor make together. Um, and these, especially the longstanding persistent AFib plays an important role because when we start talking about ablation and things along those lines, there's a big difference between persistent AFib that's been going on for two months versus a longstanding persistent that's been going on for two or three years in terms of uh, their likelihood for a successful outcome. Some other sort of uh, definitions that are out there, lone AFib, we don't really use so much, but essentially this is AFib in a young patient that has no underlying uh, cardiac disease at all. Secondary AFib, we all know about if it's happening um, in, in the setting of, a, of another problem, usually cardiac surgery, we see that a lot. And then this non-valvular AFib uh, tends to confuse a lot of people, or at least people aren't sure what that encompasses. And it's actually pretty well-defined in the guidelines. Um, it's basically if you have rheumatic mitral stenosis, a mechanical or prosthetic heart valve, or prior mitral valve repair. So it's really related to the mitral valve. If you have anything, any other kind of valvular heart disease, your AFib is not considered valvular AFib. And uh, I think because there's so many commercials out there for drugs and whatnot, and they always talk about non-valvular AFib, I think some people will you know, get a little bit uh, confused. So if you have mild aortic stenosis and AFib, that is not valvular AFib. <clears throat> and then chronic AFib does not exist. That's not a term that we like to use. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it's still probably the most commonly used term out there in medical charts, but it, you know, that doesn't mean permanent AFib. It doesn't mean persistent AFib. It doesn't really mean anything. So we try and use this nomenclature. So a little bit about the pathophysiology of AFib, you know, very generally. Um, as everybody here knows, you, once you're in AFib, you lose all electrical coordination and contraction of the, of the atria. And a lot of this comes down to um, stretch and fibrosis within the atria. And the atria are more um, likely more susceptible to um, fibrosis and than the ventricles. So you're going to have a much easier time developing this in the atria than the ventricle. Um, this can be caused by all sorts of extrinsic factors. So if you start going through the list, hypertension, obesity, sleep apnea, all these things put increased stress on the, on the left atrium particularly, and it starts, you start going down that pathway of fibrosis. Um, there's genetic variants involved in these. Uh, there's definitely you know, hereditary AFib that leads to increased um, early fibrosis in the atria, any kind of inflammation or oxidative stress, any kind of renin angiotensin activation, um, all leads to this sort of final common pathway, which is essentially atrial fibrosis. Oops. So again, a lot of things contribute to the, to the you know, final result of AFib, but most of these are go down this final common pathway of myocardial fibrosis and the atria are more sensitive uh, to this than the ventricles. And then again, AFib itself, you know, when you're in AFib, causes a lot of electrical and structural remodeling, which again uh, causes fibrosis, and that's where this old adage AF begets AF comes from. There's a lot of truth to that, even, and that this has been around for a long time, probably even before we really understood why that's the case. <clears throat> so just a quick word about atrial flutter. Um, again, very common arrhythmia, very much related to AFib, and probably even more uh, than we realized a while ago. Um, <clears throat> there's different types of atrial flutters. If you're an electrophysiologist, you're, you see a lot of post-ablation patients that have had atrial fibrillation ablations. A lot of them will come back with atrial flutter, and that is usually what we call an atypical flutter in the left atrium, and it's a circuit that can be, uh, you know, a number of different circuits that can be the most common kind of atrial flutter is what we call typical atrial flutter, and this is a right atrial arrhythmia, involved, basically a, a macro reentrant short circuit, uh, which, is, which is fairly easily uh, fixable with an ablation. The most important thing to recognize here is that atrial flutter is often the first presentation of underlying AFib, and so we frequently see patients that show up in typical looking atrial flutter. They've never had a history of AFib that we know about, and uh, we, you know, we sometimes we ablate their flutter and we feel great. We fix them. You know, they're going to do great. 
but it's important to remember that a lot, a lot of these patients, even more than I realize, over 80% of these patients that initially present with flutter actually have underlying AFib and that'll be diagnosed within the next five years. <clears throat> so personally, I'm always very hesitant uh, to stop anticoagulation in a flutter patient after a successful flutter ablation for this reason, because more often than not, they actually have AFib. And, and the reason for this um, is that this usually is that the flutter that you see is usually initiated by AFib. So the initiating rhythm is, is AFib, which we'll talk about in more detail, and then it organizes into an atrial flutter, and this is what gets seen by the time the patient presents. Um, so this is a very busy slide, but just to give you a quick idea about atrial flutter, it's not always that simple and easy. Uh, again, the, you know, we sort of break them down into, into typical and atypical. Again, you're going to usually see atypical flutters more in patients that have had prior left atrial um, manipulation with either an ablation or prior cardiac surgery. Uh, that's because there's now lines of scar in, those, in the atria, and that's where these circuits tend to develop around. Okay, so to talk a little bit more about the electrical mechanism of AFib in general, um, <clears throat> we really have to sort of break it down between paroxysmal and persistent here. Um, paroxysmal AFib is very much dependent on the triggering mechanism that puts the heart into AFib. Uh, persistent AFib, this is also important, but now we have a substrate that's maintaining the AFib within, within the atria, and so this becomes uh, of more importance. The autonomic nervous system is also extremely important. There's, um, there's uh, autonomic ganglia that sit right behind the left atrium, which play a role. Uh, we see not infrequently what we call vagally mediated AFib, which is AFib that's triggered with a, with a big vagal output. Um, you may have seen patients that complain of palpitations are going into AFib when they drink a really cold drink, and that seems to likely be related to a, a big vagal output You know, when the cold is going down the esophagus. Um, so these all play a role. The triggers, though, are, are really the most important and the most interesting to us because this is where we can intervene with ablation. We found out about 20 years ago now uh, that the vast majority of triggers for AFib come from the pulmonary veins, and specifically the junction of the pulmonary veins with the left atrium. And uh, this is sort of the seminal paper uh, to do with that by Michel Hassiguer and Bordeaux, France. And this really is what sort of birthed the um, the whole field of AFib ablation it was finding these specific triggers for AFib, so now we have a target to go after. <clears throat> so the anatomy in this area of the heart is very interesting and very um, diverse. In general, people have four pulmonary veins, you know, a left superior, a left inferior, a right and right superior and right inferior as well. There's a lot of variability among patients. You can have common veins on either side. You can have uh, extra veins, particularly on the right side. And so this anatomy, like all venous anatomy, can be variable. Um, but there is definitely something about the um, junction of these pulmonary veins with the back of the left atrium that is particularly arrhythmogenic. Um, there are sleeves of myocardial tissue that extend from the atria into the veins, uh, and that tends to be what the, those, that myocardial tissue tends to be very um, excitable and, and will have a lot of autom uh, automatic firing and ectopy that leads to AFib. So again, this is, I th this is from his original paper, looking at where these triggers that are putting the heart into AFib are coming from. The vast majority are in the pulmonary veins, and that's represented here with the four veins. There are, it is possible to have triggers from the superior vena cava, uh, the septum, the coronary sinus, and other areas. This is a, a very interesting slide, I think, to sort of demonstrate how this is putting you into AFib, just very, very, you know, superficially. The, this is a surface EKG on the top. I guess you can, I should do this here so you can see. Okay, so this is a surface EKG on the, the first three, uh, four lines. The next line is a catheter that's in one of the pulmonary veins and recording a local electrogram. And you can see that this local electrogram is, is becomes very fast and sharp and irregular. And this is actually AFib triggering here from the vein. And you can see that that's now on the top surface leads. We're now in AFib 
and, and it all started with an extra beat coming from that pulmonary vein. So this was how we originally demonstrated that triggers from the pulmonary vein um, start AFib. <clears throat> this is a now you know more modern slide. This is from our lab here. You can see we have a catheter in, this, in the top left uh, box here. There's a catheter that's within the pulmonary vein that's already been ablated and is isolated. Uh, and you can see on the very bottom, this purple line is the electrograms recorded in that vein. Again, fast and irregular. This is AFib in the vein. But if you look at the rest of this box here, um, particularly the first three lines, you can see nice normal P waves. So this is nice sinus rhythm. This AFib in the vein is not able to conduct into the atrium and put it into AFib. So this is sort of the, the cornerstone of AFib ablation, and we'll be talking a lot more about that. <clears throat> so that's the triggers for AFib, again, most important um, in paroxysmal AFib. When we talk about um, persistent AFib, we're talking about more of maintaining AFib, and now we talk about the substrate of the left atrium uh, fibrosis, like we talked about, and things like that. This is definitely much less well understood than the pulmonary vein triggers. We have a harder time successfully ablating persistent AFib because there are a lot of different mechanisms likely involved in maintaining AFib, and, and those likely vary in different patients. Um, some of the things that are definitely uh, more important is, again, the fibrotic substrate uh, that we see in persistent AFib, and probably what we call rotors, which are, which are sort of little um, uh, tornadoes of electrical activity that, that migrate around the left atrium and are likely maintaining AFib in a lot of these patients. But again, the underlying issue is fibrosis, and there are a lot of ways we can, we can measure that and look at that primarily with cardiac MRI, uh, as well as measuring the local electrical activity when we're in the left atrium. So this is just a bit of a, a diagram showing the relative importance of triggers and initiation of AFib early on, you know, when we're dealing with paroxysmal AFib, and as it, the disease process progresses and, and there's, there's remodeling in the left atrium, you start moving more towards persistent and permanent AFib, and the substrate, and the maintenance of, of the AFib becomes of more importance. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit and uh, talk more about the stroke risk reduction side of AFib, which is which is probably the more important uh, part of it, not as fun and exciting, but uh, the best thing you can do for your patient with AFib is decrease their risk of stroke. Okay, and the reason why there's a big risk of stroke in AFib is because of this little guy here, and you can see on Skype in the video uh, that we're looking at the left atrial appendage there, and that big jelly looking ugly thing is a clot that's in the left atrium. This is an extremely large clot, very unusual to see, but nonetheless, it can happen. And if this breaks off um, and leaves the heart, that can go anywhere in the body, including the brain, and cause a stroke. So this is why, in general, patients with AFib have a much higher risk of stroke. If you have mitral stenosis associated with AFib, you have an extremely high risk of stroke. Um, and these strokes tend to be bigger, uh, causing more disability higher rate of mortality and recurrent stroke for that reason. <clears throat> so not all patients with AFib have the same risk of stroke, and I'm sure you are all familiar with the CHADS-VAS score. The CHADS-VAS score is the, is the, is the accepted way that we um, measure patients' risk of stroke. We don't really use the CHADS score much anymore. The CHADS-VAS score added a couple of factors, mainly we've dropped the age down to 65, where it starts to become important being female gender is actually an independent risk factor, and any vascular disease is a, is a risk factor. So we have, it's much easier now for patients to become, to have a CHADS VAS score that's, um, you know, more than one or two and would therefore require anticoagulation. Just as, a, as an aside, it's, it's women that are less than 65 without any other risk factors, you know, by this scoring system would say, well, they have a risk score of one because they're a female, which is true, but they really should not be anticoagulated because that is a low risk population. <clears throat> I won't spend too much time on this, but you know, the way we treat the stroke risk is generally by anticoagulation so that those clots don't form. 
the mainstay of treatment for a long time was warfarin, and it, that's because it showed excellent um, efficacy at reducing stroke risk compared to nothing or compared to aspirin. Um, big meta-analysis in 2007, which was probably the last significant data to come out about warfarin, showed a 64% uh, risk reduction in ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Um, now, we all know the biggest issues with warfarin, of course, is, is, well, there's a lot of issues, but the main one is controlling the INR and keeping it in that therapeutic zone. Um, as you, as soon as you're less than two, that risk of stroke obviously goes way up. Once you're over three or four, the risk of significant bleeding goes up, and it's much hard, and it's very hard to keep patients in this range. And if you look at the trials um, that were done, you know, five, 10 years ago to, to look to get these NOACs approved, with very careful monitoring of these patients on warfarin, there's, they're only in the therapeutic range 55 to 64 percent of the time, which is pretty dismal. So it's not surprising that you know uh, these drugs don't work that well. A word about aspirin. So aspirin had previously been uh, in the guidelines and, and I guess recommended for patients with low risk. We really are getting away from this uh, recommendation. The main reason is there's not a lot of data to, to support uh, aspirin use for reducing stroke risk in AFib. If you look at this meta-analysis, uh, almost all of the, um, of the of the gains are driven by the SPAF trial, which was a flawed trial for a number of reasons, stopped early, um, and this was really where most of the data came from. It's a modest benefit at best. It's felt that it's it's most likely any benefit is probably due to the effect on vascular disease as opposed to um, you know clot formation and stroke in AFib in general. Uh, hasn't really been studied well in a low-risk population, which is generally who we're giving it to. Um, and there is a bleeding risk with aspirin. There's always more data coming out with aspirin, particularly with cardiovascular disease, but the bleeding risk is not trivial. Um, and you're, so it's really, we've gotten away from aspirin use in the guidelines. Um, in, the, in the AHA guidelines, <clears throat> they, if you have a CHADS VASC of zero, they just state that you can omit antithrombotic therapy. If you have uh, CHADS VASC of one, uh, they can say you can no thrombotic therapy or you can consider aspirin, and that's that's only a 2B recommendation. Uh, in the European guidelines, they've got away from it altogether. They flat out say do not offer aspirin monotherapy for stroke prevention with AFib. So that brings us to the, the novel anticoagulants which have been around for a while already um, that you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Most, you know, the ones we are most familiar with are rivaroxaban, apixaban, uh, and dabigatran, which is uh, Zarelto, Eliquis, and Perdaxa. There's a lot of big studies uh, to get these drugs approved and, and, and in use, and uh, these are large randomized clinical uh, studies, and they all essentially showed uh, benefit over, over, over warfarin. They were all compared their drug to warfarin. Um, I won't get into the minutia of the differences in, the, in, in these studies, but I think the most important takeaway is that they all very significantly reduce the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, uh, which is, of course, one of the, I mean, the most feared issue with warfarin. They all also at least um, were as good as warfarin in reducing stroke risk, if not better, in a lot of cases. I like to show this slide because Happy faces and sad faces are easier than looking at all those numbers, but you can see that all the drugs, dabigatran, apixaban, and rivaroxaban, are all at least as good, if not better, than warfarin. Uh, and this is again coming from their sort of seminal trials. <clears throat> uh, it's, there's always more data coming out with these medications, and it's it's pretty much now. Um, either registry data or retrospective uh, data looking at you know quote real world data. Um, this is the this is the largest one that's probably the most recent uh, to look at um, these drugs and, and try and compare them to each other. So there's been no randomized controlled trials of the newer drugs head to head, and there probably won't be. Um, but this is a, a good study. It's it gathered data from from Medicare and Medicaid, and as well as four commercial. Um, claims databases, so it had a huge amount of patients that it looked at, over 300,000. This was, of course, a large heterogeneous group, and so they did compare outcomes just looking at that, but again, there weren't, these weren't matched patients. They, they took, they were able to take out, you know, 285,000 patients from this group, and they did, tried to do a direct comparison 
between warfarin and each individual drug, as well as each individual drug uh, compared to each other. And they did this based on cohorts and trying to, you know, propensity uh, score match the groups to try and compare, um, you know, evenly risked, even risk type of patients. Now, obviously, you know, this is still a retrospective um, analysis, but uh, it was some, showed some interesting findings. You're not going to be able to see much of this, but I'll, the, the top uh, graphs are, are each of the uh, drugs compared to warfarin for the risk of stroke or embolic or systemic embolism. And so this is uh, Pixaban, Dabigatran, and Rivaroxaban, and they all were better than warfarin, again, consistent with their clinical trials. The bottom one is, is the risk of bleeding, major bleeding, the same drugs, significant improvement here. Um, in this particular study, rivaroxaban was more along the same, uh, you know, equal with, with warfarin. The other ones were significantly reduced. This is looking at comparing the NOACs head to head, again, to be taken with a grain of salt because this is all retrospective, but this is a pixaban versus the bigotran in the risk of stroke, Pixaban is a little bit better. Uh, same with the Pixaban versus Rivaroxaban and uh, Rivaroxaban and Dabigatran about on the same line here. Uh, and this is the same thing with bleeding risk. So uh, this particular trial, you know, was pretty favorable for, for a Pixaban. Um, I will say it, there was funding involved that was from uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb and a Pixaban. So, you know, take that for what you want, but um, there, there are lots of now, um, retrospective, um, big database studies looking, trying to trying to figure out the real world data on these drugs and trying to tease out some comparison. But again, it's tough when you're not doing a, a randomized trial comparing these drugs. <clears throat> All right. So if you can't anticoagulate a patient um, and you want to reduce their stroke risk, the, the other option is to is to um, occlude or ex exclude their left atrial appendage, so no clots can form there, and you can't um, you can't form a clot and it can't leave. This is you know many patients, as you know, can't tolerate anticoagulation for a number of different reasons. Most frequently, it's a bleeding reason or GI bleeding, but of course, anemia. Uh, recurrent falls or unsteady gait is a is a is an increasingly uh, big issue that I see for patients that can't stay on anticoagulation, and then you know less frequently this sort of high risk um, lifestyle with risk for bleeding, uh, getting out there hiking and biking or doing whatever where they're worried about having a, a, a trauma and a bleeding event. So the, so that's where the Watchman device comes into play. Um, this was approved a number of years ago already. Uh, the FDA indications for use are fairly broad. It's essentially anybody with AFib that is at increased risk for stroke and um, are felt by their physicians not to be suitable for warfarin. And then they have to have an appropriate rationale to seek a non-pharmacological treatment. Again, this is, I think, probably purposely very broad and unclear. Uh, <clears throat> if CMS is gonna pay for it, they want a little bit more um, stringent and, and, and um, laid out criteria. So they recommend or they require, I should say, a CHADS score of two or a CHADS VAS score of three. We have to have a formal shared decision making with the patient and the physician, which basically means you need to talk to the patient and explain what you're suggesting and why it may be helpful for them and they have to agree. Um, they have to be suitable for short-term warfarin but not acceptable or not able to take long-term anticoagulation. And, uh, and the reason for that is once we put a watchman in, patients do need to stay on warfarin for about six weeks. So this is a, uh, you guys know that this is a procedure we do in the cath lab. It's done through the femoral vein. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, the device itself is a, is a 160 micron uh, membrane. It has a nitinol frame. It has 10 little anchors in here that help grab onto the left atrial appendage tissue when it's being deployed. Uh, but it, it also is, uh, it's, a, it's like a springy self-deploying um, uh, device so that when it's deployed, it, there's some tension and uh, put on the left atrial appendage just from its, uh, you know, being unsheathed. There's a lot of data behind Watchmen. I will, I, again, I won't delve too deep into this, but there's been a lot of patients studied in ran multiple randomized trials, uh, all of which have, have, have done very well when compared to warfarin. 
you look at safety, we can successfully implant these devices in 95% of patients with about a 4% complication rate, which is essentially in line with other left atrial uh, procedures. There's an 18% overall reduction in, in, in events, which is generally systemic um, uh, embolic events. Low, 55% reduction in disabling stroke, 80% reduction in hemorrhagic stroke. Again, very important, and this is be likely because they can now come off of long-term anticoagulation. Uh, some studies show actually reduction in all-cause mortality, probably related to the hemorrhagic stroke reduction, and um, again, able to discontinue warfarin in the vast majority of these patients that get a watcher. <clears throat> Oops, I'll show you a very quick um, little video of how this watching is put in. So again, this is what I was saying. It's a, it comes sheathed and it self expands once it's unsheathed and, and that pressure is what helps to keep it in the, uh, in the left atrial appendage. There are different size devices depending <clears throat> on um, the size of the particular left atrial appendage, which does vary a lot. done through the femoral vein up to the IVC and a sort of standard transeptal uh, catheterization, which in the EP lab we, we do multiple times every single day and is, I will say, it's fairly routine. So I'll show you a little cartoon from within the right atrium. We bring the, the sheath up to the fossa ovalis. We find the place where we want to cross and we cross. Um, so again, the watchman has its own particular sheath, which is in there now, uh, that has, uh, that we bring the actual device up through that sheath and it also has sizing markers to help us figure out what size device to put in. Again, this is just talking about the different, um, anatomical variants of the left atrial appendage, which of course are going to be named after food. So we maneuver the sheath into the left atrial appendage, um, and then we bring, we bring it to an area where we're going to deploy the appropriate size device based on those markers. <clears throat> device is then brought up through the sheath. So again, this is, of course, being done under fluoroscopy, so we can inject contrast dye into the appendage to get a good look at exactly where we're sitting there. Okay, so the Watchman um, actual device is now brought, brought up through the sheath, brought to the end, and then the sheath is sort of pulled back so the device deploys itself and expands. The expansion sort of grabs onto the the os of the left atrium and those little anchors help it uh, stay put as well. We make sure that it's secure in there. We test to make sure it's where we want it to be, and then eventually we release it. Okay, and I'll move on from there. So, in terms of uh, the timeline and how these patients are treated, again, like I mentioned, after the device is, is put in, they need to be on warfarin for six weeks, along with aspirin, while it's endothelializing and healing. Uh, after that, we do another TEE to make sure it's where it's supposed to be, and it's and there's no leaks around it. It's adequately occluding the appendage. At that point, they come off warfarin, and they can take uh, aspirin and Plavix up to six months, and then they stay on aspirin lifelong. <clears throat> All right, so a little bit now about the rhythm control aspect of AFib, and, and we'll get to ablation as well. Um, I think it's important to understand that AFib generally is a progressive disease. It always starts off with one episode and eventually it becomes recurrence and if it goes unchecked in a lot of patients, it eventually becomes persistent. And this happens in 20% of patients that can happen within a year. When I particularly am thinking about, you know, how we're going to treat a particular patient with AFib, uh, these are those things that are generally going through my mind. Is this treatment going to work, first of all? Is it going to improve their quality of life? Is it going to reduce their stroke risk? Is it going to reduce their mortality risk? And of course, is it safe? And, and so that's how we sort of feed patients into the right treatment plan. These were large, so the first thing you have to decide is, do you even want to try and get the patient back into normal sinus rhythm, or are we happy enough leaving them in AFib and, and what we call rate controlling them? <clears throat> 
And there was a lot of um, interest in this in the early 2000s. I mean, there's always been, but there were two big trials in the early 2000s that tried to directly compare these two strategies, uh, tempted to show the benefit of antiarrhythmic therapy in keeping patients in AFib, but it had surprising results. Um, these were over 4,000 patients, and they found that there was really no mortality benefit uh, in the antiarrhythmic group, and, and there was no reduction in stroke risk in these patients. And if you actually look at the AFFIRM trial and, and the RACE trial as well, they were statistically equivalent, but there was actually a trend towards decreased mortality in the rate control group. Uh, so this, I think, raised a lot of eyebrows, and people looked at this a little bit closer and trying to figure out what are we doing wrong here, or what, you know, why aren't we seeing benefits to, to trying to keep these patients in normal rhythm. And I think there were a couple takeaway points. So one is this was, uh, this was a patient population with the mean age of 68 and 70 years old, uh, which is consistent with the population of AFib in general, but there still are a lot of younger patients with AFib, particularly uh, that end up in electrophysiology offices. And so I don't know if we can necessarily uh, translate those results to a younger patient population that would live in rate-controlled AFib for a long time. Um, the other major thing is the only way they really had to try and keep patients in normal rhythm in this trial was antiarrhythmic medications. This was basically before the time of, of AFib ablation. And so was it the antiarrhythmic meds themselves that were the problem? If you looked at patients that were on antiarrhythmic meds, they had a significantly increased risk of mortality. Um, but if you tease it out a little more and you look at the patients that you were actually able to keep in sinus rhythm, they had a significant decrease in mortality. So. Was it the medications that were the major problem? Because it seemed like if you could actually keep a patient in normal rhythm, that they did do better. Uh, the other big take-home message, because the stroke reduction was not uh, reduced, sorry, the stroke risk was not reduced in the rhythm control group, and I think they found what happened there was a lot of physicians had a false sense of security when they put a patient on an antiarrhythmic, saw them in the office a couple of times, they were in normal rhythm, said, great, we'll stop your anticoagulation. Um, and a lot of these patients went on to have strokes, unfortunately. And I think the takeaway, take-home message from that is you really, you really don't know if these patients are going in and out of AFib, and, and antiarrhythmic drugs are really not so great to rely on that way. So then that sort of brings us to ablation, and can this, um, uh, you know, be a way that we can keep patients in normal rhythm and give them the, the benefit without exposing them to the harms of antiarrhythmic medications? So the first question that I always ask myself is, does it work? And a lot of that depends on how you define it. If you go by the HRS, the Heart Rhythm Society's uh, consensus, they define success as freedom from any symptomatic or asymptomatic atrial fib, atrial tac, or atrial flutter episode lasting longer than 30 seconds. So that's pretty stringent. Uh, but clinically, if you see patients with AFib, uh, you really want to know if their AFib burden's gotten better and particularly have their symptoms gotten better. So for a, just to sort of highlight this, you can do an ablation on a patient and put a 30-day event monitor on them a few months later, and they can have 45 seconds of an atrial tachycardia uh, that they never feel or know about, and that's going to be a failure in the clinical trial uh, for AFib ablation. Uh, but clinically, when you see that patient in the, in the office, if they've had a lot of AFib leading up to it, they're going to feel great and, and they're going to be very happy. So I think clinically that would be a success. The early data uh, from AFib ablation was, was very um, heterogeneous, looking basically at uh, comparing radiofrequency ablation with antiarrhythmic drugs. You know, very basically, they, this is early on, they found the single procedure success rate off of antiarrhythmics was probably around 50 to 60 percent. If you needed multiple procedures off drugs, you're up to now maybe 70 percent. Again, single procedures with medications afterwards or multiple procedures, you could maybe get this up to close to 70 percent, um, but in general was not, was not great. Um, complications related to AFib ablation, I think these have improved, but nonetheless it started off even very low. The overall um, um, complication rate's about almost 5 percent, but most of these are minor. If you look at really serious ones we think about, there were zero procedure related deaths here in over 5,000 cases. Um, <clears throat> stroke, uh, of course, very worrisome, but very low rate, 0.3%. Uh, tamponade or, or pericardial fusion and tamponade was less than 1%. Uh, 
And again, you can see the other ones. The main driver here actually of this total 5% was um, pulmonary vein stenosis of 1.6%. And that's really not an issue anymore because of the way we ablate um, AFib has changed somewhat. So um, this has gotten a lot better. So if you take it all together, uh, we generally based on this, we would call it about a 77% or so uh, freedom from AFib with a 5% complication rate with ablation versus if you look at all antiarrhythmic medications, it's about 50% uh, and quite a high complication rate from these meds, as you know. Um, I'm going to sort of just skip through a bunch of this so I can show you some stuff and take any questions if they're there. Um, this is this is looking at different um, modalities to ablate AFib. Uh, we have radiofrequency, which I'm going to show you, and uh, cryo, which I'm going to show you. And let me get to some of this. Let me just quickly touch on the Cabana trial. Okay, this is a very important trial. This was sort of going to be the holy grail of EP because this was a large randomized trial of, of ablation versus uh, medications, and, and the goal of this trial was to actually show some improvement in hard outcomes, not just symptoms, uh, to look at is there an improvement in mortality, is there an improvement in strokes, and so on, if you ablate patients. Um, and so this was not that this was recently presented actually, or well, about a year ago now, and recently um, published in JAMA. Uh, is about 2,000 patients. Again, typical AFib patients randomized to ablation versus drug therapy. The patients were followed for about four years, and they looked at a, a hard uh, clinical composite endpoint of death, stroke, bleeding, uh, or cardiac arrest, and then there were a number of secondary outcomes. Uh, the the the, uh, the, um, the outcome that made all the news and and you know little bits on the media was that there was no difference. Okay. Uh, in their and which is true, the primary outcome of this trial did not meet statistical significance, uh, either on um, the event rate uh, or mortality. Okay, now, um, like any trial, we like to try and tease out the parts that we like. Okay, um, so if you look at there's there's some reasons for this, uh, which you can you can talk about, but again, it doesn't change the actual outcome. There was a very large. Um, so, of course, this is an intention to treat trial, okay, which all large clinical trials are, meaning that you are you become a part of the analysis in the group you're originally assigned to, okay. But the problem is there was a lot of crossover between groups in this trial. So, actually, 17% of patients that were assigned to the uh, drug therapy group actually crossed over and ended up receiving ablation, okay. So, these patients then get analyzed in the drug therapy group even if they're doing better or worse. And if you actually look at this data based on treatments that the patients actually got, so the patients that actually were bladed versus the ones that were not, there is a very significant difference in these groups. The primary outcome uh, reached statistical significance and you know had, went from seven, went from uh, almost 11% down to 7%. The mortality actually showed a statistically significant uh, improvement from 7.5% to 4.4%. So again, this doesn't mean that, you know, that's, that wasn't the primary outcome of the trial, but interesting nonetheless. All right, so let me show you a few, I have about five, 10 minutes left, and I'll show you a few things that we do in the EP lab. Okay, the first thing I wanna sort of make you aware of is intracardiac echocardiography, or ICE, which is a, which is a, a very important uh, tool that we use every day. Okay, this is a catheter uh, that is, that has ultrasound and basically uh, it's an echocardiogram that's done from within the right atrium or wherever you place uh, the tip of the catheter. So we have some home videos here, try not to get nauseous, but this is what ice looks like in the lab. This is the catheter, this is the ice catheter is up in the right atrium and it's looking down at the left atrium and we're using it to cross the septum here for transeptal. This is uh, standard of care for transeptal puncture and has made the safety of it you know, much, much better. Uh, there's a couple of, of tools here that I'll show you once it loops around. But you can see there are wire going across uh, into the left atrium and the, that's actually the pulmonary vein there. So if you look here, the first thing that cross, or, and now, sorry, the wires across and now you can see there's a sheath there. Uh, right there. So that's the sheath now across the septum. Uh, another nice tool that we use in the, in the EP lab is this special wire uh, that is very, very sharp at the tip and then has a, a, a J on it. So once it's out of the sheath, it immediately curves on itself to form a J so that it can be advanced into the left atrium without causing trauma. 
This lets us cross the septum, you know, very um, uh, in the exact area where we want to be, and, and then gives us an instant rail to bring the sheath across. So ice is very helpful there. Uh, I'm going to skip that for now. <clears throat> Okay, so when we're in the EP lab uh, and we're, 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 you know, thinking about ablation, the first thing we do is make a map of the left atrium for both anatomical reasons and to look at the, the voltage or the electrical health of the tissue in these areas. So that catheter that's floating around is, is being manipulated into the pulmonary veins and in the left atrium, and it's recording data there. Um, it's recording a ton of data, but the most important is, one, it's being recorded exactly where it is in space so that it can create a three-dimensional um, rendering of the left atrium wherever it's been. And that's the, that's the you know, the, the colors that the things that are starting to come up on the screen. The actual colors are meaningful as well because all of the, the catheter is picking up the local electrical signals wherever it is, and it's assigning them a, you know, a, a color based on how um, strong the electrical signals are there or how small, okay? So the red is, is, is either no or very small electrical activity, which is what we would expect because, because that's out, in the, in, out deep in the pulmonary veins. As we're sort of more in the left atrium, you're starting to see more purple because there's larger, more healthier electrical activity in that area. Um, as, it, you know, as the catheter is, is, is traveling in more of the left atrium, it starts to sort of come together to see that we're looking at the left atrium from, from the behind. These are the left pulmonary veins that are red there, and now the catheter is starting to get into the right pulmonary vein, goes into the right upper vein. And we go on like this, we, we, we map out the entire left atrium uh, to look at the electrical health and, um, and to have a, basically a roadmap for when we want to do the ablation, which involves isolating these pulmonary veins. So a finished product of these maps looks something like this. And and, it, and so we have pre and post basically on the left and the right side. The top left one is a redo. So this is one that somebody that's already had an AFib ablation, but you can see very clearly there's these purple islands that are still connecting the left palm, upper pulmonary vein and the, and the left atrium and same on the right side. And we're able to pick this up using some newer, higher density maps. And then once we go and ablate them, we get a nice you know, uniform uh, lack of electrical activity in those pulmonary veins. So this is a, a nice little cool map. You know, we talked a little bit about atrial flutter, so it's not always just isolating pulmonary veins. Um, when we are dealing with all sorts of atrial flutters in the left atrium, these maps can be very helpful because they show us the voltage and the health, and they also show us activation sequence of these flutters. So these flutters are usually short circuits that are just going around and around uh, the atrium, and if we can find a sort of critical area where all the electrical uh, current is being sort of funneled through, that can be a good target for ablation. And in this case, um, you know, if you can try and imagine or try and void out all the noise that's in there, you can see there's this representation of a, of a signal going around here and everything sort of being funneled down the roof through this little channel of diseased tissue between scar. And so that was clearly a critical area for this flutter circuit. And that's where we ablated to, to close off that channel. Okay, and once we did that, this flutter terminated and, and that was it. All right, uh, real quick in terms of uh, ablation catheter technology, um, being able to sense the force at the tip of an ablation catheter is probably the biggest advancement in, in ablation uh, in a long time. Show you what that looks like. So now we're looking at the same map, but now we're ablating. <clears throat> this is the tip of the catheter there that's starting to do the work. And you can see this green arrow, which is showing us the direction that we're applying force on the catheter. And there is also um, a lot of data here, but this force here where the number's going up, five, six, seven, is showing us how many grams of force we're actually applying. And we can use these numbers very uh, in, a, in a great way where we can sort of more objectively um, know what kind of ablation lesion we're delivering, how effective it's likely to be in the long term. And this, this has helped us a great deal in making sure we get uh, effective and durable ablation lesions.
show this real quick. This will probably be the last thing I show you. The other way, we, whoops, the other way that we ablate is by using cryo, okay? And instead of doing point by point um, ablation using a catheter, this is a balloon technology where we achieve the same goal of isolating those pulmonary veins, but it's all done in sort of a one-shot deal per vein, sort of stamping the whole area around it um, and, and freezing the area to, uh, to isolate the vein, okay? And so this is a reenactment of that. Again, similar idea. We have a balloon that's brought up through a sheath. It's inflated. <clears throat> it's brought up to the to the os or the entrance of the vein, and uh, we our goal is to occlude blood flow from that vein. Okay, if we do that, we know the balloon is touching the entire circumference of the vein, and so when we start ablating, we know we're not going to miss any points. So we inject contrast. We confirm that nothing's coming back out of the vein into the atrium, so we must be occluding it, and then we start freezing. We usually give about three to four minute freezes, and the temperature gets down as low as 50 to 55 degrees Celsius, and that causes um, cryo injury to the cells, which make it them unable to conduct electrical signals. That's the cartoon. This is what it looks like in real life. <clears throat> Again, we're doing this all under fluoro, there are ways now we're doing it with less fluoro, but this is still the best way to sort of visualize it. Again, the um, catheter is going out into the pulmonary vein as sort of a rail. Uh, the balloon is uh, positioned and eventually in, in the pulmonary vein and inflated, which you'll see in a second. <clears throat> so the balloon's inflated here, okay? And then we uh, maneuver it into the antrum of the pulmonary vein. Again, just like the cartoon, we inject some contrast into the vein to make sure nothing's leaking out. So we have a nice seal here. We know we're touching the tissue on the entire circumference. Plus it's a very, you know, it's we're far outside of the vein and we start freezing at that point. Okay, so um, I think I'll leave it at that since we're about out of time and uh, sorry it went a little over, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Chuck. Great, great review. What's the current uh, thinking with respect to convergent? Thanks. Yeah, so convergent is a, I didn't get a time to really go in, into that. Um, so convergent, just for people that don't know, is a is a, another type of ablation, which is essentially a hybrid with uh, CT surgery and the electrophysiologist. It's the goal of a convergent is to get ablation not only on the pulmonary veins, but in the whole back wall of the heart, which is also a very big part, particularly of persistent AFib. And that's done by um, a, a minimally invasive surgical approach coming you know, through the, through the uh, sub-xiphoid approach, and they're actually going from instead of the inside to the outside of the heart and ablating the back wall of the heart. Um, there's not a ton of, there's, there's no big data like there is for conventional ablation. And I think the thinking varies a lot um, site to site, and a, a lot of it is um, operator dependence, and there's a lot of variation in how much ablation can actually be done on the surgical side of things, depending on pericardial reflections, you know, how experienced the operator is and how much they can do. Um, I will tell you personally, I've seen, you know, excellent results even going back a long time ago. Um, patients that, you know, this tends to be a treatment option for patients with persistent AFib, uh, very large remodeled atria, uh, maybe failed prior ablation. And there's definitely patients that you would never think uh, would maintain normal rhythm, uh, and they do. So it's, I can't tell you what their success rate would be, um, but it's definitely appropriate in certain patients and can be successful. So you refer patients for mm -hmm. I do, I refer, so generally, like I said, generally patients that are you know, very already come to me and they're already in long-standing persistent AFib, very dilated atrium, where I feel like a, a conventional ablation is probably not going to offer much chance of success. Uh, or a patient that's already had an ablation, there's not much else I'm going to be able to do endocardially, uh, then yes. Anybody else? Oliver? Um, in my mind, I'm always thinking to refer somebody who's relatively symptomatic with their Right. Do you have any more kind of preference? Would you say you have to be highly symptomatic, or uh, even personally, you know, some of our heart failure patients? Right. Yes. Uh, 
they say they're not asymptomatic, but really the more they're infected, the more often they're getting decompensated. Yeah. So, so tell me how, what kind of approach are we doing? What kind of yeah. things we'd like to do with that? So I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, so just a couple, a lot of stuff there. So the first thing is technically still the only real indication for AFib ablation is symptom control. And that was part of the Cabana trial was to try and show that there's some more to more benefit to AFib ablation than just symptoms. And it, you know, depending on how you want to break down that data, it may or may not have shown that. Uh, but regardless, it's so it's symptoms. And and I always tell patients the symptom aspect of it only they know, right? Only they know how symptomatic they are. So I and when I'm trying to decide with the patient if if we should be thinking about ablation or not, you know, I, I put it back on them. I say if this is something it doesn't really bother you that much, it's not affecting your quality of life then you probably don't need it. If, it. if it is, then, you know, it's something you should consider. And so, you know, I'm happy to always have those conversations and help them understand better what's involved and things like that. Um, the second part of that is the heart failure aspect, which is a very uh, interesting area. There's been, a, I didn't get a chance to show it, but there's been a couple really nice randomized trials on AFib ablation uh, in heart failure patients, specifically the CASEL AF trial. Uh, and that actually up, you know, got incorporated in the updated AFib guidelines because it showed a lot of benefit uh, in ablating patients uh, with congestive heart failure, actually mortality benefit. And so um, I'm all, I have a much uh, of a lower threshold, I guess, to ablate patients that have uh, reduced EFs or heart failure because exactly like you said, you can't always tease out their symptoms uh, if they're related to AFib or they're just more short of breath than they would be otherwise, et cetera. So, you know, if, they're, um, if, if there's a question, um, I, I always offer it to them. All right, thanks.